There was a time from the beginning of March where we were seeing images coming in from across the world and then from Italy and then from London and then it was getting closer and closer. None of us knew what to expect. Um, the modelling and the numbers that we were given were really, um, uh, they were frightening. We had to then assume that every single patient we saw in the emergency department was somebody with COVID. And so that meant that suddenly we had to have fresh PPE for every single patient that we saw. The national guidance wasn't as explicit as it was now. And ultimately, uh, Margie and I had to make some decisions about what PPE was going to look like for us. The one thing that kept me awake at night was not having enough PPE. The last thing I wanted was to be nursing one of my colleagues. Uh, you know, we're not the military. We don't turn up to work and expect uh, that something serious might happen to us. There was a genuine fear for people's safety and well-being. For me, it was sort of an obvious thing to, to reach out to the hospital and try and make contact with relevant people to see if there was a way that, as a university, personally, as a group of uh, young researchers, how we could help. The hospital has links with the university and a team from the engineering department came down to the emergency department to see what they might do to help. I think engineers naturally are fixers. You break a problem down into small problems, solve those individual steps to, to achieve your overall goal. Whenever there's an interesting problem or a hard problem or a challenge, then we're in there. The virus was expanding and it's, it was accelerating and they were being bombarded on, on every front, really. Practically, the challenges there are, are, were extreme. I was contacted by Dr Lunt, um, who said, look, you know, we're a mechanical engineering department, how can we help? We spoke a little bit about what we needed, we spoke about what the design may be, but actually evolving the design, making sure it was fit for purpose, making sure it would protect the staff, that was something which the university just took on. And that was amazing. The brief was, uh, can you produce uh, PPE in large quantities uh, in a local setting for our community? So another issue that we identified was that within the rooms in which we see our patients, a lot of our kit is just exposed. We realised that actually if, if we could have someone design some cupboard doors that would keep all of our kit on our trolleys safely stored behind, and those cupboard doors then could be easily sterilised down, then we didn't need to move our equipment, but we kept our equipment sterile. So we just quickly sketched up the doors, um, got them laser cut, and uh, got them out of the door just before the labs shut down completely uh, at the start of the first lockdown. Um, so we were being told, uh, you've got to um, get out by the end of today, and we're there um, with our Perspex sheet just saying, just cut these up before you shut down. We have the, the equipment, but not only that, it's, it's the skills and expertise. Uh, There's obviously some sort of very experienced and fantastic people um, that are able to look at an issue and come up with a design and then turn that design into an actual product in, in a very quick period of time. While the, the, the initial focus was on the PPE, there was this side story which was um, to do with uh, oxygen monitoring. There was a real pattern emerging that if people's blood oxygen level was collapsing rapidly, that they were going to become critically ill quickly. So identifying those individuals was crucial. There was a need for pulse oximeters, so for the devices that can measure blood oxygen saturation. And as a biomedical engineer, I, I teach this, this material on courses. I've worked with companies developing this technology before, so we felt that that was definitely something that we could work on. We, we managed it quite carefully, so we would say, well, I'm good at doing this bit, so I'll do this bit. You're good at doing that bit, you take that. There was kind of leave your egos at the door, and admit when you're not very good at doing something and let somebody who is take that on. We are very happy to see that we have some long-term impact. So we've published a research paper, we've published an open source design so that people around the world can build these devices. And um, one of our reviewers actually built the device themselves and gave us feedback. Not only had we designed something that was used locally, but actually someone on the other side of the world had replicated our design and it, and it worked and they were going to be using it as well. In March 2020, when the pandemic was, was just starting, then everybody was worried about uh, ventilators uh, being in short supply. If you ended up in a particularly acute situation, what you might consider is ventilating two patients from one machine. The RUH um, asked whether the university could 
investigate that possibility. Using this expertise in, in fluid systems, we did a study particularly looking at how we could um, individually control the airflow to two different patients connected to one ventilator. The supply chains going into the medical sector were really badly overrun. So if we could design a particular device that helps with the dual patient ventilation in a way that it could be 3D printed at a hospital, we might get round some of these supply chain issues. We developed a method which we were able to test out using a ventilator at the Bath Clinic um, with test lungs to prove that the, the method actually worked. We were also asked to see if we could um, get some gowns uh, designed and get them organised. So we reverse engineered an existing gown design. So what we ended up doing was contacting a group of local sewists and they produced a huge number. It's absolutely amazing. So it was a whole package of things that went on, but the main activity was the face shields. In the first instance, we built a prototype with some foam, acetate and elastic from Hobbycraft. There was four of us who every evening for maybe two or three weeks, maybe a month, were just producing these face shields. And then the question was, how do we increase production? We sort of did the maths, okay, how many patients does the RUH see a day? Okay, we're gonna be need needing to make this many thousand. And at the same time, we were being contacted by care workers, we were being contacted by the council, by pharmacists, um, all telling us that they needed access to PPE. What we really wanted to do was, was move production into the department. And as I'm sure you can imagine, at the time, the department was shutting down. And there we are asking, can we, can we come back in to make these face shields? And it says a lot about the department and the management, uh, I think, that they saw this as a very important uh, activity. So the dean was very helpful. He got in touch with the vice chancellor. It went through a very quick process and that same afternoon the Dean rang me back and said, you know, absolutely fine. But it couldn't have been done without you know, the university backing that and agreeing that this was absolutely something the university should and could lead on. We identified this lab that we're in now, the undergraduate teaching lab, was an ideal situation. It's big, it's spacious, we've got, it was airy, we'd got plenty of ventilation, we could easily observe the two metre social distance. So it was absolutely ideal, it couldn't have worked out better. The most complicated thing that we did in the, the whole of the PPE event was just to try and organise the logistics of getting the, the raw materials in. At a time when the raw materials were not readily available because all our normal supply lines were cut. We put a call out, a press release in the local community and it, it was just the most phenomenal response. Literally hundreds of people from across Bath and Wiltshire getting in touch with us saying, yeah, I, I've got 10 glue sticks in my kids' art cabinet, I've, I've got a packet of acetates. And they were driving them to campus and dropping them off. Thanks to people in Bath, we got through that sort of two-week period where it was just impossible to source anything and then slowly supply chains started to fall into place. So we had to ring around sometimes to different potential suppliers and then um, organised for them to send stuff in. And some of them were fantastic because they, they donated some of the materials free of charge when they knew what we were doing. There were clearly financial implications of creating thousands of face shields and, and pieces of PP. Um, in the early days, we were incredibly fortunate to be approached by a private donor who offered to cover um, the first sort of few weeks' worth of materials. It allowed us to go out and, and essentially make some promises to suppliers that we would be buying a minimum amount so they could justify opening up their businesses again. And as a result, we were able to create that large number of, uh, of face shields and PPE. One thing that we did do is that we went through all the regulatory processes for the face shields. If we are providing protective equipment, we need to be 100% sure it, it protects, that it does that job. And so we were fortunate in that we had equipment here on campus so we could do the regulatory tests here and check that our designs were going to work. Um, but we also needed to get that stamp of approval from the notified body. And that was important to have that certificate so that the hospital would then be able to use it. We put together a series of, um, of our own tests and then we had to put together um, a big bundle of documentation. So I was helping Elise with making sure that what goes in the documentation is what really happens on the production line. And we worked together to make sure that our design, our processes and what we actually made were all compliant with the British standard. Some people didn't have access to the equipment that we had had because we'd got the accreditation. We ended up 
testing on campus quite a few of other people's designs just to make sure that they were going to get the correct uh, regulatory approval. So while all this is going on, we are also lecturers and having to deal with students at what was a very, very challenging time. We were working really long hours, it was on top of our normal jobs and it was, it was, I think for me, in a way almost quite selfish. I needed to be doing it, needed to think I had a role. The department is built up with many people with such a diverse skill set. Um, so that includes everybody from your academics, technicians, admin staff, uh, we've got the catering team, the, the security, everybody has a skill set. Uh, and by bringing all of those together, that's where we, we really saw the main benefit. You could see the severity of the pandemic and how it was getting worse. And when we got this opportunity to, to do something and actually put our skills to a use, we all jumped at it very much as soon as we could. We were working three shifts seven days a week and people could actually book themselves on the preferred slot, be it morning, uh, afternoon or evening. And they didn't really have time to get out and get some food. So uh, as soon as we found out about this, we started to send food across to them every day, breakfast, lunch and dinner for all of the volunteers that were working there. It was just a, a great feeling of, of teamwork all around. It just sort of renewed your faith in, in mankind, really. I mean, the, the fact that the, we, didn't, we never had to struggle to get people to volunteer. A lot of people, they were trapped in their houses. They hadn't, they hadn't been part of anything for a while. And then all of a sudden, they could be part of this project and know that the work that they were doing was helping. I think we delivered to possibly three or four different locations at the hospital during that period. You meet people, you get to know them, you make contacts and, and the gratitude was always there. I mean, obviously they couldn't have been happier to receive these supplies and uh, they certainly made us aware of that. I have a tremendous amount of pride in the way that the whole of the team pulled together. It was a very intense period. We were literally on the phone to each other uh, several times a day. Um, when we started off the production line here, I was here virtually every day. If we think a little bit more internationally, more globally, so I sat on a few of the government panels and tried to help advise with some of the supply chain issues that we were facing. Uh, beyond that, we had the SODIT, so the UN-run organisation, who came along and we produced drawings, designs that we could share freely online, and they made several videos, translated it into multiple languages, and those have gone uh, across the world. Here in Bath, we have people who are really motivated, and when there is a will, we can mobilise, we can change things. I think it has really um, shown people another side of the university, that the university is uh, a place where ideas, not just where ideas happen, but where um, action happens. The fact that we had PPE made by people that knew what they were doing, that had tried and tested, that had looked and, and, and researched all the other PPE out there, made such a difference to our lives. The fact that bags of PPE were arriving from the University of Bath was reassuring for people. My two priorities are my patient and looking after my team and I was able to equivocally say we can get PPE, we're going to look after you. We had the ability to lead on this and so stepping up and doing that was the right thing to do. It was just incredible to see this sort of generosity of spirit, of, of money, of, of time to, towards helping each other and really trying to battle through this, this time. We did something useful and that that gives a great deal of satisfaction, a great deal of pride in the team, and the amount of spirit that was, uh, the public spiritedness of all the volunteers was amazing.